there was a biker sitting at a green light. He was wearing a leather jacket. He had all the skull and crossbone stuff, chains hanging from everywhere, big long beard. He had a filthy old hanky tied around his head. And he was sitting on the biggest, meanest looking Harley Davidson you ever see. It sounded like thunder. An 85 year old man pulled up alongside of him on a moped. <laughs> Have you ever heard a moped? There's nothing thundery about a moped. Ringy ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Ringy ding, ding. The old man looked over at that bike and you could see his eyes were filled with amazement. He said, that's a beautiful bike. He said, can I look at it? The old man sneered and said, yeah, if you want to look at it, look at it. Or the uh, biker, excuse me, sneered. I got the two mixed up there for just a second. <laughs> the biker sneered at the old man. He said, yeah, if you want to look at it, look at it. So the old man leaned over, got his face about that far from the bike and just looked at every inch of it. Man, he said, I bet that goes fast. The biker thought, I'll show him how fast it goes. That light turned green. He popped a wheelie, and within 30 seconds, he was doing 200 miles an hour. He glanced in his rearview mirror, and there was a little dot in his rearview mirror, but it was getting bigger. Something was gaining on him. It went by him so fast that he didn't even see what it was, and it disappeared over the horizon. Pretty soon he saw something coming back the other way. And as it went past him, he recognized it. It was the old man on the moped. He looked in his rearview mirror and it disappeared into a little dot. And then he saw it coming back again. <laughs> he stopped his bike and that moped hit the back of that big old Harley Davidson. It destroyed the whole back of the bike. And of course, the moped was nothing but metal. The old man was laying on the ground groaning. The biker got off and he said, are you okay? He said, are you okay? Is there anything I can do for you? And the old man said, yes. Could you unhook my suspenders from your handlebars for me? I see some people going, I didn't get that. I <laughs> see, his suspenders were caught in the bike. And, uh, <laughs> I want to say this, if you want to be prepared for life, you got to know what you're hooked to. You got to hook yourself to something, friends, that's going to give you the ride in life that you want. My whole message tonight is that the Lord has his hand on every person sitting in this room. And he has called you to action. And we've got to respond. Years ago, I wrote a book entitled How to Speak to Youth and Keep Them Awake at the Same Time. I wrote one chapter in that book trying to help youth directors communicate clearly with young people, I wrote a chapter entitled, Making the Scriptures Come Alive. I stood up in front of about 4,000 youth directors one day to give that talk, and I looked at that title, and my blood ran cold. Making the Scriptures Come Alive. I suddenly saw what that title was about. That title implied that the Scriptures were what? dead and that somehow you had to fluff them up and make them alive, take them out of dead to life. When I rewrote the book, I retitled the chapter. Instead of calling that chapter, How to Make the Scriptures Come Alive, I retitled it, Who Killed the Bible People? <laughs> Do you know who killed the Bible people? We killed the Bible people. Because tonight I'm going to tell you a story about a Bible person that certainly is a hero. But most of us put 
these people on a pedestal way above what they should be. We assume that the heroes of the Bible are people who, were, who had an advantage that we didn't have. They were more spiritual than we are. They, they had some kind of supernatural advantage, and it just isn't true. I'll tell you something. We have the supernatural advantage because the Holy Spirit is with us every second of every day. They didn't have the advantage. You read Hebrews about that hall of faith and then go back and study those people's lives and you find weird people, you find liars, you find cheats, but they were people who were touched by God. And I believe with all of my heart that God is going to touch some people here tonight. The person we're going to look at tonight is the person of Moses. And in fact, if you take notes or you have your Bible, I'd like you to get that ready to go. Because this is one of the most exciting aspects of Scripture I think I've ever come across. It's found, what we're going to cover tonight is found in Exodus chapter 3. And the whole story is the story of God's call to Moses. Exodus chapter 3 starts this way. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Chapter 3. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Already I'm excited. Maybe it's because God made me weird. Maybe it's because I see stuff like this and I just can't read past it. The man is at the far end of the desert. There's nothing around. It's hot. It's dry. And a bush starts burning. What do you think he did? Well, most of us think he was a Bible person. He responded supernaturally to these things. He, w he didn't respond the way a normal person would respond. He's standing in the middle of the desert, and all of a sudden, this bush, it just bursts into flame. What do you think he did? Do you think he stood there and went, Behold. <laughs> Verily, a bush burneth. <laughs> do you think that his blood pressure might have gone up a little bit? Do you think he might have been a little bit excited about this? In biblical language, it says this. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Now Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. This is beautiful. Not only did it just burst into flame, but it didn't burn. Oh, it burned, but you know it didn't burn. There was no ashes. It didn't crinkle up. Nothing fell to the ground. It was just burning. And Moses went, whoa, the butane bush. <laughs> now, some of you may have your Bibles open. I see several going, I don't see the word butane anywhere here. <laughs> All I'm trying to do is to help you understand that these people are like you and I. They had feelings like you and I. When that thing burst into flames, he had to get excited. In fact, it says here, it says here, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. Now, if you translate that Hebrew into modern language, it comes out like this. Whoa. <laughs> A butane bush. That's the translation. <laughs> so the Bible says he goes over there. And it says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over, God was watching this. We have such a wonderful God. He's watching this. He said, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, then God spoke to him from the bush. Behold, a bush speaketh. No, let me tell you something. I believe that God did this for a reason. We got a creative 
absolutely wonderful God. You know why he did this? Because he wanted to get Moses' attention. That's why he did this. And God will use many, many different creative ways to get your attention. And he wanted to get Moses' attention, and this did the job. Let me tell you something. If you're standing in the desert and a bush starts burning and that doesn't get your attention, and if it burns but it doesn't really burn, you know, nothing burn, nothing, no ashes or nothing, just keeps burning and burning, but it doesn't burn and that doesn't get your attention. If the book, if the bush talks to you, that will get your attention. <laughs> so Moses is out in the little, middle of nowhere and it says... God called to him within the bush, and God spoke his name, Moses, Moses. You ever had God do that? I don't mean call you Moses. I mean call your name. <laughs> I had to clarify it because, again, I saw several people going, no, no, he never, <laughs> never called me Moses. If you got a piece of paper out, I'd like you to think right now for just a second. I know within this last week, if you trust Christ as your Savior, if you make yourself open to God at all, there may even be some people sitting here who have never trusted Him. You don't know Him, but He has been trying to get your attention, and you know it. You know it. And those of you who do know him, you may have a friend at work and God has tapped you on the shoulder. He's lit a bush on fire a half a dozen times saying, talk to that person. There's a relationship in your family or your extended family that is unhealed, that needs, that needs work, that needs someone to begin by saying, I'm sorry. And God has tapped his finger on your shoulder. He's lit a bush on fire a half a dozen times and said, you need to do something about that. God got Moses' attention. And if you got a piece of paper out there, and I know that God is talking to you even as we speak, you might want to jot down what it is that God wants you to do. And you know it. You know it beyond the shadow of a doubt. It might be that he wants you to take a step of faith and move away from a very secure position in order to do something like this gentleman did. I don't know what it is. All I know is that we don't have a dead God. And he constantly tries to communicate us with us so that he can bring us to a point where we can experience the kind of life he intended for us to experience. What is he asking you to do? It might be something in your life that you know is absolutely wrong. And you've been messing around there for a long, long time. And God has lit a bush on fire and he's doing it again tonight saying, this is it, no more. You're destroying your life. I don't know what it is. All I know is that when God taps you on the shoulder to get your attention, you better pay attention. He came to Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said this, I am the God, your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. You know what I find interesting in this portion of Scripture? Up until that point, the general language of the Scripture would indicate that Moses was curious about what was happening. As soon as he found out that God was talking to him, he got serious. Then the Lord said, now listen to this. I have indeed seen the misery of my people, my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. Underline that if it's in your Bible. I have come, I, I have come down to rescue them. This must have brought a tremendous amount of joy to Moses because his people were going through some really bad stuff. They were dying, they were being persecuted, and now here's God saying, I have come down to rescue them. And in his heart and mind, Moses is going, come on down. 
they're hurting real bad. Come on down and fix this mess. I bet you there's some of us that pray that and think that all the time right now. Our world is headed on a course that is a dangerous and horrible course. Morality is on a downslide. And we say, God, come on down and do something. Moses was in a situation where his friends were dying. You know something? I'm tired of seeing kids take their lives. One of the greatest killers of young people is suicide. I'm tired of seeing marriages fall apart. The difference between our society and the society that Moses was in is not all that great. The world is in absolute misery, desperate for some kind of help. Families are falling apart. Hearts are broken. People commit suicide. They drown themselves in alcohol and drugs to avoid the problems that they cannot face in this world. There are heartbreaks more than we can count just in this room. And God has seen that. When you go to work, it isn't just you going to work. You are touching the lives of hundreds of people who don't have any hope. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. It amazes me. Fifty years has taught me this. You can't believe what you see on the outside. People who look like they're successful, people who look like they don't want to have anything to do with God are dying on the inside. And God sees it, and He hears their cry. And His message isn't much different than it was to Moses. I have come down to rescue them. I would like you, if you would, to look at verse 10. Same conversation, only a few words in between. Listen to this. Let me read again God's word. I have come down to rescue them. Verse 10. So now I'm sending you. I have come down. I'm sending you. How do you suppose Moses responded to that? Moses, I have seen the misery of your people, and I have come down to rescue them. Come on down. Come, come on. <laughs> they are bad people. You come on. <laughs> and God says, now you go. No, you said you was coming. Come on down here. <laughs> he didn't understand. One of the greatest sermons I ever heard preached was preached by a man by the name of E.V. Hill. And the title of the sermon was, You Are God's Answer. God has chosen in this day and age as he chose in this day and age to use his people to address the problems of this world. We want the preacher to do it. We want David Jeremiah to do it. We want somebody else to do it. And God says, no, no, I'm sending you. What did you write down? What thought came to your mind when I talked about God tapping you on the shoulder? Nobody else can do that. God has chosen to use you. And you know what Moses did? He started making the wimpiest, saddest excuses you have ever heard in your life to try and get out of this. When we think of Moses, who do you usually think of? Charlton Heston, right? <laughs> Am I not right? The Ten Commandments. <laughs> Head of the NRA. Charlton has been a man that can get stuff done. A hero kind of guy. Chiseled features. Rugged muscles. Standing there in that long flowing robe with that beard that reached almost to his knees and blew gently in the wind right at the end like that. <laughs> Isn't that the image we get? And that's the image we like to keep because as long as we keep that image, of the people that God used, then we can make this excuse. That was a different kind of guy. That was a Bible guy. That was a Charlton Heston kind of guy. And those are the kind of people that God uses. I could never do that. 
That's exactly what Moses said. God said to Moses, now you go. Look at this next verse, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I? (laughs) Who am I? I? Translation. I'm a nobody. Please write that down. Because it's the same excuse we use. I'm a nobody. I'm just, it's just me. (laughs) Right underneath it, write what God's answer is when we use that excuse. When we say to God, I'm a nobody, God's response is this. I know. See, now I see several of the Bible scholars going, I don't see that here. (laughs) Where does it say that? Let me tell you where it says it. It says it right here because God did not respond to Moses and say, I will make you somebody. I will make you great. Do you know, I used to be afraid to give a testimony because I didn't think I had one. All the testimonies that I heard were these huge, inspiring, you know, I was into drugs. I killed seven people with a wet squirrel. (laughs) I shot peanut butter in that vein right there. (laughs) Crunchy peanut butter. (laughs) It drove me nuts. I don't have a story like that. I got drunk every night, and I was with a different woman every other night. Then when I was seven years old, I met Jesus, and my life changed completely. (laughs) Now, if you have a testimony like that, that's fantastic. But I thought that those are the only kind of testimonies God used. What is my testimony? I was born, and then I came to know Christ at uh, about seven, and I went to church most of the time. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) God did not say to Moses, I will make you great. That isn't what he said. When Moses said, I'm a nobody, basically that's what he was saying. I have no, I, I have no qualifications. Who am I? God did not say, I will make you great. I will give you qualifications. That isn't what he said. What did God say? This is what he said. I'll go with you, Moses. He says, I know. When we say, I'm a nobody, God says, I know but I'm a somebody. God is not looking for extraordinary people. God is looking for ordinary people who will trust an extraordinary God. That's what he's looking for. How can God use me? I look at my friend David Jeremiah. I look at the great preachers of the world. I look at the great minds of the world. I look at the athletes and I say, Lord, how can you use me? Someone who observes cats and dogs and thinks up weird things about them. (laughs) Someone who preaches messages on the fact that cats can't be Christians. (laughs) How can you use me, Lord? I see several people going, I have a cat. (laughs) You know, I got a letter from a lady once, and literally it started out, I'll have you know my cat's a Christian. (laughs) And she told me about how her cat watched Christian TV, (laughs) and he would walk away when they turned to the bad channels. and It was hilarious. Let me, I got to tell you real quick. Here's the difference between a cat and a dog. Are you ready for this? Cat, a, a dog goes, oh, you pet me. You give me food. You put a roof over my head. Oh, you must be God. <laughs> a cat goes, oh, you pet me. You give me food. You put a roof over my head. I must be God. (laughs) How 
in the world can God use someone like that? Folks, I've had the privilege of being in this city and sitting in front of some 60 or 70,000 men and proclaiming the gospel because God does not look for extraordinary people. There is nothing extraordinary about me. I just said, Lord, use what I've got. And he said, I can do that. It's not a good excuse. Who am I? I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Can I tell you something? How many teenagers in this room? Raise your hand. Or, or people below 18. Let me see your hands if you're below 18 years old. How about up here? Let me tell you something, young people. You and God together are a team that can't be beat. You can't be beat. And it doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 80. It's not a good excuse. Who am I? Have the preacher do it. Have one of the staff do it. I'll go with you. Now, if God came to you, if you complained to God and said, God, I'm afraid about this thing you've told me about. I can't do it by myself. And he said, I'll go with you. If he said that to you verbally, I'll go with you. I have a feeling that most of the people in this room would go, yes, okay, Lord, it's you and me. Let's go. Not Moses. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you said you was coming down. And you backed out on that. <laughs> and, and okay, so you said that I that you will go with me. Okay? But now does this sound familiar? Listen to this one. I don't know what to say. Does that sound familiar? Lord, I just don't know what to say. What will I say? Write it down. It's the second weak, lame excuse. I don't know what to say. When you say to God, I don't know what to say, he answers the same way he answered Moses. This is his answer. I'll tell you what to say. Now again, I see the Bible scholars searching their Bible going, I do not see that anywhere here. When Moses said to God, I don't know what to say, God's answer to him was, say this. And he goes on for several verses telling Moses exactly what to say. When I was in youth ministry many years ago, I saw the most amazing demonstration of this I've ever seen in my life. I was challenging young people to tell their friends about Jesus Christ. There was a young lady in our club in Denver by the name of Beth. Beth is what is termed in original Hebrew a space cadet, a sweet, <laughs> sweet child. But I mean, she just was flakier than all get out. You say, are you mocking her? No, I've told you I'm not okay. She wasn't okay either. God isn't, <laughs> God isn't looking for okay people. He's looking for people to little trust him. So I'm challenging them to share the message of Christ with their friends. Beth comes into my office, tears streaming down her face. She said, I don't know what to do. I said, Beth, what's the matter? She said, I have so many friends, I just don't know what to do. I said, Beth, pick one. And I, I'm serious. She went, oh. <laughs> she said, I don't know what to say. I said, Beth, talk to her about what Jesus has done for you. Bring her to a meeting, why don't you? And afterwards, just talk to her. So Beth decided she was going to get this now, witness. She was going to witness that thing you do. You know, witness is not... Let me tell you something. You are witnessing from the day, from the moment you get up until the moment you go to bed. Witness is not something you do at a certain time of the week. It's a way you live. And most people get scared to dead, death about witnessing because they think of it as this little thing. They're waiting now. They got it in their pocket. This is my witness, and I'm waiting for opportunity. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Is this the time I should witness? And that's what Beth had done. She had a little tract in her pocket, and she was going to witness. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm telling you, witness is greater than that. It's bigger than that. 
God is more involved than that. So she brought this girl to the meeting, and on the way home, she said, what do you think of the meeting? She's driving her home. And the girl said, I thought it was great, except for the Jesus part. And Beth got scared. This is going to make it harder to do the witness. <laughs> she said, what do you mean? She's frightened. She's uptight. And the girl said this. God could never forgive me for what I've done. And Beth forgot about the witness part. She said, what are you talking about? Let me tell you about my life. And she shared some of the things she'd been involved in and how God had come down and rescued her from a life that was headed for certain destruction. And the girl said, boy, I wish I knew that kind of forgiveness. And Beth said, you can. And the girl said, how? And they continued talking. And finally, this young lady said to Beth, will you show me how I can accept Christ? How I can know his forgiveness? And Beth said, sure. The witness was forgotten way down in the pocket. They pulled over by the side of the road and she prayed to receive Christ. Beth came into my office on Monday. Tears streaming down her face. She told me the whole story and continued to weep. I said, Beth, what's wrong? She said, now I'm done. I don't have anybody else. <laughs> I'm only exaggerating a little tiny bit. <laughs> I said, Beth, pick someone else. And she went, oh. <laughs> her senior year in high school, Beth led seven of her friends to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and she still doesn't know what to say. <laughs> God will tell you. You just got to be obedient. I don't, I don't know what to say, God. I'll tell you what to say. Say this. Would that get you? I think I'd get in line. I'd be ready to go. <laughs> Not Moses. <laughs> well, what if they don't believe me? You know what? The part of Moses should have never been played by Charlton Heston. <laughs> the part of Moses should have been played by Martin Short. <laughs> what if they don't believe me? What if I say all that? What if I tell them all that? And I want you to read this. I don't want you to take my word for it. Read this fascinating story. And they don't believe me. You know what God's answer to that is? It's not your job. We carry around this tremendous guilt because God is, has lit a bush in front of us and said, go do this. And, and we expect that it's our job to get results. That's God's job. He just wants us to be obedient. Sometimes we won't see the results that we want to see. That's God's job. It is not your responsibility to bring people into the kingdom. You don't have that ability. It's your responsibility to be obedient and let people know about the great love that's available through Jesus Christ the forgiveness, to tell other people about what he's done in your life. It's the Holy Spirit's job to draw men and women to himself. It takes a tremendous load of guilt from our shoulder. If it's my job, then you know what I have to do to you, my friend? I have to manipulate you. I have to use everything in my little bag of tricks to get you to respond. God says, no, be faithful. It's not your job. Again, the scholars are searching their Bible saying, the word job does not appear here. What are you talking about? God did not say to him, do it this way in the word. What he did was he said, I'm going to show him. I'm going to be the power. This, when I read this, I, I, it took me an hour. And the reason it took me an hour is I kept being interrupted by laughter because I saw this as real. Moses' excuse is, what if they don't believe me? And this is how it went. <laughs> Moses What's that in your hand? It? 
What is that? It's my sheep stick. <laughs> when I'm out here watching the sheep, sometimes they go where they're not supposed to go. <laughs> and then I go, bad sheep. <laughs> my sheep stick. Moses, throw it down. Why? <laughs> Isn't that what you do? Why? It's a good sheep stick. Moses, throw the stick down. <laughs> okay, no need to get testy here. Do you know the story? When he threw it down, what happened? It turned into a snake. And of course, being a Bible person, he went, behold. <laughs> what was straight is now crooked. I love the way the Bible talks about this. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he threw that thing down and it turned into a snake, and he did the same thing we did. The Bible says he put his knees to the breeze, and he buggeth out of there. <laughs> now, <laughs> see, the scholars are going, buggeth is not here. <laughs> what it means is he ran from the snake. He threw that thing down. He had no idea what was going to happen. He just threw it on the ground and went, yeah, wah, and he was gone. You can't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. The Bible says that God said, come on back here. <laughs> Moses, come back. He's looking at that thing. And then God said, pick up the snake. <laughs> no. Pick up the snake. <laughs> Am I right or not? Isn't this the way we go with God? You made the snake, you pick up the snake. <laughs> Turn it back into a stick, then I'll pick it up. Moses. Okay. He tried to distract the snake with his microphone. What happened when he picked up the snake? It was a stick again. Tell me his blood pressure didn't go up. Tell me his eyes didn't just get huge. I threw, God, I threw it down. Oh, I wish there was somebody here. Sheep. <laughs> Come here. I threw it down and it turned into a stick. And then it was a stick. <laughs> look at, look, look at me go, I'm stuck. Look at, look at, look at that one. I'm stuck. Snake stick, snake stick. <laughs> look at this. Moses. Why? <laughs> Put your hand in your coat. I can't. <laughs> I got a stick in my hand. <laughs> Moses. Okay, I'll hold you. Set it down there. You're not going to make five little snakes, are you? <laughs> Moses. I know I add just a little bit to this. 
but the point is exactly the same. <laughs> Moses, take your hand out. <laughs> Are you following along? What did he see? Leprosy. He saw his own death sentence written on his hand. He would be ostracized from his family, from the community. His flesh would rot away. The flesh in his face would rot, rot away. Everywhere he went, he would have to shout, Unclean! Unclean! And people wouldn't go near him anymore. And eventually he would die. And there was no cure. He did not take this lightly. The Bible doesn't go into detail, but he did not take this lightly. He was a dead man. Well, I'm really sorry I played with the snake thing. I mean, <laughs> Lord, why? Why did, you, why did you do this? Moses, put your hand back. Lord, please don't make it worse. <laughs> Moses, put your hand back in your coat. <laughs> Take it out. Lord, why are you doing this to me? Are you still following along? No, you shut your Bibles. <laughs> You already know what happened. What happened? It's clean. It's clean. He got healed. I saved you. <laughs> he got healed. Folks, listen to me. When God taps you on the shoulder and lights a bush and says, go do this, he's going to go with you. Believe me. He's going to tell you what to say. You'll walk out of those situations, right? Because you've been there going, oh, how stupid, 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 stupid. How stupid could I have been? Why did I say that? And God's going, because I told you to. <laughs> you were looking for the perfect words. God was looking for the words that would touch the problem, reach the heart. He'll go with you. He'll tell you what to say. And it's his job to accomplish what he sent you there for. Sometimes when it looks like it's all falling apart and nothing is working right, God is working and you just can't see it. It's our job to be obedient. That's all. He'll take care of the rest. Now you would think Moses got it, right? No, he keeps on going. He doesn't get it yet. Listen to the next excuse. Excuse number four. Moses said, I don't, basically, this is the translation. I don't talk, I don't really talk very good. I don't talk very good. Some scholars tell us that Moses probably stammered. Now he's using this as an excuse. I don't really talk good. It doesn't matter. I know people who can't talk at all who do more than some of us who can. I have a friend, David Ring. David is an evangelist, goes all across the country, has cerebral palsy. If he were to... Has David been to the church? You've heard him speak. You've heard him speak. It's very difficult to understand him. You have to listen for every single word. He spoke on the East Coast in, in uh, Lynchburg, and they jammed the phone lines. There were more calls than any other time in the history of that television program. And this man has a great sense of humor with his, with his speech. It just blows me away. We were in, uh, we were moved, uh, we didn't move into Canada. We were going into Canada so that we could get to Alaska. And I have to tell you the truth, friends. I am a nasty person when people don't treat me right. I have to work so hard to continue to be gracious. And we crossed the border, and there were customs people at the border. 
I got across. I was so angry. When David came across, I said, David, if customs people are going to be in heaven, I don't want to go. <laughs> David had just crossed the border. I believe it was one of his first times to go across. He had brought hundreds of videotapes and stuff with him. And I'm going to talk a little like he talks right now. I'm not making fun of him. He'd tell you I'm his friend. And he crossed away. He said to me, he said, I came across and they are mean people. He said, that man looked at me and he said, what's in the boxes? He said, I look at him and I say, video thing. He said, the man pointed his finger at me and he said, how many? I said, I don't know. He said, the man said, you count them. David looked at me. He got that twinkle in his eye and he said, you know, suddenly my handicap got worse. <laughs> he said, I began to count one... <laughs> he said, the man screamed at me, what's wrong with you? <laughs> he said, I look at him and I say, hey, now you made me lose count. And just in case there's some of you who say, I, I don't think it's nice to talk like that. I told that story in front of 11,000 people. David was sitting right in the front row. I walked off the stage. He walked up to me and went, money, you owe me money. There was a young couple in Denver, Colorado that came to me. They wanted to work with young people. They wanted me to train them. The man said, I just, he was, he's not slow mentally, he just talks slow. I just, and I'm a type A person, I'm going, <laughs> And when he blinked, he didn't even blink fast. He blinked slow. <laughs> I wanted to say, blink! <laughs> Just want to learn how to reach. kids. Whoa! And inside I'm thinking, you can't reach anybody. But I was the trainer. Mr. Communicator, I give seminars all across the world. I trained that young man. I trained him for six months. And at the end of six months, folks, he came into my office and said, Thank you. <laughs> I wrote him off. A couple of weeks later, the phone rang. Excuse me, a couple of months later, the phone rang. I picked it up and said, Could you come out and speak to our group? And I went out to that little place where he had his group. And his house was packed with 300 young people. God doesn't care if you blink slow. <laughs> he doesn't care if you talk slow. It's not an excuse. 
when we use that excuse, you know what God's answer is? Same as it was to Moses. Moses said, I don't talk, I don't talk, talk good. I don't, my slow, slow of spe- speech. And God said, who made you? I know what I'm doing. And then Moses came up with the winner. Verse 13, chapter 4. Moses said, Oh, Lord, please send somebody else. (laughs) Does that sound familiar? Write God's answer down to that one. No. No. Oh, you can choose to disobey at that point, but God's answer is no. There is a world full of hurt, a world full of pain, a world on the fast track to death all around us. It may not look like it from the outside, but on the inside, people are dying. Sometimes it's right in our own families. And I believe with all of my heart that God has lit a fire in some of you tonight, and he has said, I want you to go. I'm coming down to empower you, to go with you, to give you what to say, to make them believe. I'm coming down, but I want you to go. But God, I'm... Mm -mm. He's going with you. I don't know what to... Mm -mm. He'll tell you what to say. What if, don't go there. (laughs) It's not your job to make them believe. It's not your job to fix it. It's your job to be obedient. I, (laughs) the title of this is A Wimpy Prophet, A Butane Bush, and No Excuses. (laughs) What does God ask you to do? The final response is either send somebody else or, Lord, send me. There was nothing special about Moses except one thing. In spite of all of the excuses, he still ended up obeying. And because of it, the people were free from their slavery. It was his obedience that makes him a marvelous hero. God has spoken to you tonight. What are you going to do? Because if you hitch yourself to him, it's going to be a ride you will never, ever forget. God bless you.